rather than practice pessimism, perhaps we should practice some productive paranoia. Well, hey there. Welcome to the Retirement Answer Man Show. My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. Excited you're here. This is the show dedicated to helping you not just survive retirement, but have the confidence to rock retirement. Now, last week we talked about optimism, and I am generally an optimistic kind of guy, but optimism can only get you so far. Like the golden mean Aristotle talked about, having too much optimism can just have a life of where you're wearing those rose-colored glasses and you think, oh, it's all going to work out. That's not the kind of optimism I'm talking about. So I wanted to clarify a little bit. Now, the antonym to optimism is pessimism. And I looked that up in the dictionary. And pessimism is defined as the tendency to see, anticipate, or emphasize only bad or undesirable outcomes, results, conditions, or problems, etc. I'd take optimism over pessimism every day, but not in a rose-colored glass sort of way. So what is something maybe a little bit more productive than pessimism that we can make sure we have a, uh, a dose of, a splash of, along with our perennial optimism? Well, as I was thinking on that, it made me think of the book. I think it was Good to Great. I know it's a Jim Collins book. I just can't recall which one. Jim Collins is a Stanford professor and researcher that did a lot of research on what made companies great. What set the great ones apart relative to the ones that were not so great? And one structure he came up with, which I think is a great replacement for having a dose of pessimism, which I'm not necessarily a fan of, is to have a dose of productive paranoia. I think you can be an optimist. You can look optimistically to the future and have some productive paranoia. Now, I am on jimcollins.com site. I want to read what he says about productive paranoia, and it is from the book Good to Great. The only mistakes you can learn from are the ones that you survive. Leaders who strive off decline and navigate turbulence assume that conditions can unexpectedly change violently and fast. They obsessively ask, what if, by preparing ahead of time, building reserves, preserving margins of safety, bounding risk, and honing their disciplines in good times and bad, so they can handle disruptions from a position of strength and flexibility. Ooh, I like that. Rather than be a pessimist, to be a productive paranoia, which means not just simply having the worry about everything going wrong, but using this angst in a productive way to constantly ask yourself, what if, what if? And to build margin into the system so you can absorb fast violently changing situations and act in ways to mitigate such damages or take advantages of opportunities. So I like that much more than just simply being an optimist or being a pessimist. I'm Be optimistic, but practice some productive paranoia. With that, let's go answer some of your listener questions. <laughs> I invite you to join me tomorrow, October 27th or Saturday, the 29th of October for a live meetup where we're going to share a framework that you can use to help give yourself more confidence in your retirement plan. And we're going to invite you to join the Rock Retirement Club, our online platform with retirement calculators, education, coaching, Everything you need to put together a plan of record you can have confidence in. You can do that at livewithroger.com. Now it's time to answer some of your questions. If you'd like to ask a question to me to hopefully be answered on the show, go to rogerwhitney.com forward slash ask roger. 
And you can type in your question there. If you leave an audio question, we try to elevate those. They're sort of like the fast pass. We've been starting to get more of those. So you're going to hear a lot more of those on the show. So let's get to some of your questions. Our first question is from Scott, and he says, Hey, Roger and Nicole, I appreciate your show. Enjoy the rock retirement concept. My question is related to backdoor Roth conversions. He says, our wife and I are riding the edge of being able to make any direct Roth contributions. So I would like to make a post-tax IRA contribution and roll that over to the Roth. And they don't have any money in IRA, so this would be just for this function of doing a backdoor Roth contribution which helps. It's a little wrinkle in the code that allows you to get around the the limits on income in terms of what you can contribute to a Roth. His basic question is, can backdoor Roth contributions be made throughout the year, like every month, or only in one fell swoop? Well, the short answer is, Scott, yes. From a control standpoint, you can make non-deductible IRA contributions throughout the year and then do Roth conversions either throughout the year or all at once at the end. Now, you say that you ride the edge of being able to make Roth contributions. My suggestion would be to practice some self-control, which I'm guessing you're pretty good at, and keep building that money aside in an after-tax account. And then at the end of the year, look at, well, whether you can make a Roth contribution or not. And if you can, you can go ahead and just make the Roth contribution. And if you cannot, then you can make the non-deductible contribution to IRAs all at once and then work on the conversion. Logistically, that's going to be a lot easier in the event that life situation changes and you won't have to deal with the custodians in terms of making deposits and everything else. But yes, you could in theory, do it the way that you're talking about. But I would suggest that maybe just set it aside in an after-tax account and do it in one fell swoop once you know where you're going to fall in terms of that edge of being able to do direct Roth contributions. Because if you can, then it'll make the whole thing a lot easier. Speaking of contribution limits, I saw that the IRS posted their 2023 contribution limits for various retirement-related accounts. They give us a little bit of a bump there, and I'm looking at the IRS there right now, and contributions to 401ks and 403bs and 457 plans. The employee contribution has increased from $20,500 per year to $22,500, so an increase of $2,000. The limit on annual IRA contributions has increased to 6,500 from 600, so a little bit of a bump there. The catch-up provision for 401ks for those that are over 50 and are making employee contributions have increased from 6,500 to a total of 7,500. So between that and the 22,500 employee contribution. If you're over 50, you can put about $30,000 into 401ks. And then they increased various limits around the total income that you can have put into it. Now, specific to what Scott was just talking about, the income phase-out range for taxpayers making contributions to Roth IRAs has increased to between $138,000 and $153,000 for singles and head of household. Excuse me, that's for a married couple. No, 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 that's for a single couple or head of household. And then for a married couple, it has gone from 218,000 to 228,000. These are now the phase out ranges for Roth IRAs. So perhaps Scott, you'll be riding the right side of the edge when it comes to that. We'll have a link as soon as we put something together on all the important numbers for 2023. Next question is from Dennis on tax-efficient contributions to charity. And it's a boom audio question. Let's hear from Dennis. Hi, Roger. This is Dennis. My wife and I listen to the podcast. It's given me a lot of great insight over the last couple of years that I've been listening. We're both 64 and I do have a plan of record. Thank you for suggesting that to so many of your listeners. It's really helped me identify how and when to pull levers and forecast where our money's coming from in retirement. But I do have two questions for you, and it has to do with taxes. 
My wife has an inherited IRA that she's been taking RMDs from because when she inherited from her mother, she was already receiving RMDs. So can we use those RMDs as qualified charitable distributions so that we never even see that income as part of our regular plan of giving, of uh, of donating? And then the second question would be, you know, we've got enough IRA and 403B assets. Could we use that as in some kind of donor advised fund to do the bulk of our charitable giving since we can't deduct that from our taxes anymore? Thanks again for a great podcast. Keep up the good work. Nicole, love having you on the show. Well, that's great to hear that you have a plan of record, Dennis. That definitely keeps some structure to your decision making. And this whole game is about being really good at making lots of decisions and getting better at it. So let's address your question in a couple parts. One is in regards to qualified charitable distributions. You're talking about taking RMDs, required minimum distributions from an inherited IRA that your wife has, and then doing some QCDs, having that money go directly to charity. I think that's actually a great way to of passing pre-tax money to charities without ever having taken receipt of the income and having to go directly to a charity that keeps it as a tax neutral event. And you can indeed use inherited IRA money to do QCDs or qualified charitable distributions. There's a couple wrinkles here I want to make sure we point out. Number one is to do a qualified charitable distribution, the money goes directly from the IRA to the charity. And if you work with your custodian, They have a system or a protocol set up to have it happen that way. You don't want to take receipt of the money and have the money distributed to you and then go ahead and write a check to the charity. It has to come directly from the IRA. And the second wrinkle here, in your case, Dennis, in order to do a qualified charitable distribution, you have to be at least 70 and a half at the time the QCD is requested. So it can't just be at the end of the qualified year. If I heard correctly, you two are like in your mid-60s. So you wouldn't be able to do a qualified charitable distribution until you weren't just in the year that you're turning 70 and a half, but you actually are 70 and a half at the time you request that distribution. And so that's one wrinkle I want to make sure I point out. And these can only be done from IRA monies. They can't be done from a 401k, unfortunately. And I think the limit this year is up to $100,000. Yeah, $100,000 as an individual taxpayer per year. Now, let's switch to your next next part of your question in terms of donor-advised funds. Donor-advised fund is essentially a private charity established a lot of times by a major investment firm, Vanguard or Schwab or otherwise. And you can donate money to a donor-advised fund, receive the charitable deduction, even if you haven't picked the end charity that it goes to. And they have mechanisms where you can then, at a later date, say a request that I have X amount go from my donor-advised fund to the Red Cross or some other public charity. So unfortunately, you cannot do a qualified charitable distribution to a donor-advised fund because one of the rules around that is if you do a qualified charitable distribution, it has to be to a public charity, not a private charity. So that means a donor advised fund is not possible. So back in 2017, when we increased the standard deduction threshold, many people don't itemize their taxes anymore because the standard deductions are so high. And what that means is if you make, say, charitable contributions, you may not be able to get any impact from a deductibility standpoint to a charity because it's all covered by the standard deduction. And the answer to that is going to be to batch your contributions in years to do an itemized tax return in one year rather than spreading out your charitable contributions. So as an example, rather than donate $20,000 a year to your favorite charity, which is going to show up on your Schedule A, that's not going to be itemized anymore. Perhaps you donate three to four years to a charity all in one year, so sixty to eighty thousand dollars, and then do an itemized tax return, and you'll get more bang for your bucks from a tax deductibility standpoint. That could literally add up to thousands of dollars of savings that you wouldn't otherwise get if you just did them 
on an annual basis and never got to the point where you were above the standard deductions. So hopefully that helps you, Dennis. Congrats on your plan of record. Our next question comes from Jeff related to how to deal with capital gains. So Jeff says, hey, Roger, we have invested our majority of our funds, our assets in qualified and non-qualified accounts into mutual funds. These funds were an easy way to diversify in our accumulation years. With recent market downswings, I am expecting us to see unpredicted capital gains, though we do not sell, but we saw our portfolio drop. How would you advise clients to invest to better manage investment capital gains so they can be intentional in crossing or not crossing IRMA thresholds? Not letting taxes or IRMA control our retirement, but do not want to increase or our tax or surcharge because we accidentally crossed a threshold by, say, a dollar. Great question, Jeff. And you make a good point in that if you've been investing for years, meaning decades, and now you're reaching retirement, this is especially true for after-tax assets, you likely have been using traditional open-end mutual funds. These were the traditional funds that many baby boomers invested in. And they were actively managed by a portfolio manager. And at the end of the year, the portfolio manager or the fund is required to distribute to its shareholders any gains that they received by selling stocks or assets throughout the year. And as an investor, you would pay your tax on that portion of those realized capital gains. Now, in the accumulation years, most likely what you've done is just simply buy more shares of the same fund and reinvest. And that technically is a purchase of more shares. And that's where you've gotten this great compounding effect over, well, a long period of time. But you don't have control over when they sell individual assets within the bigger portfolio that you own. So sometimes these capital gains distributions can be surprising because they happen right at the end of the year. And if you're not aware, throw you into some other tax category that you weren't expecting to be thrown into because of a larger than usual capital gain. And what Jeff is referring to in down markets, when you're in normal public open end mutual funds and we're in a bad market like we are right now, mutual fund managers, in addition to investing the assets, also have to be good cash flow managers, meaning every single day they are receiving people investing in their mutual fund and they have to get those dollars to work to be fully invested. But then they're also getting people selling the mutual fund and asking for their money back. And when they Sell. So generally, a manager is going to keep a little bit of a cash buffer. But during really bad markets, it's very normal for consumers to sell their stocks. And, you know, this has been shown in studies over and over again. When markets are going down, especially if they've gone down for a while, investors sell low and they generally go buy high when they're feeling better again. But the problem with that when you own open end mutual funds is that if everybody is selling the fund, the manager has to have the money to give those investors their money back as they leave. And that means they go through their cash buffer, but they may have to sell stocks or whatever the investments are in the fund to raise the cash to give those people their money back. So even if you're a long-term investor, you're sharing in this common pot of funds And when they sell a stock to try to give somebody else their money back, even if you're a long-term investor, you're going to realize your portion of that capital gain. So this is what we're talking about here. (sighs) Okay, so that sets the table. So Jeff, one good thing about our tax system is that there are very few things that suffer from a cliff where if you're $1 over a threshold, that it impacts all of the dollars. We're an incremental tax system. Irma surcharges, which is the surcharge that can be applied to your Medicare premiums, unfortunately, is one of those cliff type of structures, meaning if you're $1 over, you're going to pay more for all of your Medicare, even though regular tax dollars don't really work that way. So to give you a flavor of that, if we look at the IRMA surcharges, they look at your modified adjusted gross income from two years prior, and we're not going to get into IRMA today, but just trying to give you an example. But as a couple in 2022, if you made less than $182,000, you just paid the rack rate 
for Medicare. But if you earn over $182,000, if you earn $1 over $182,000 as modified adjusted gross income as a couple, you're going to pay an extra $60, $70 per month for Part B and Part D. So this is what Jeff is referring to. So how do you manage this, Jeff? Let's get to the point here. Well, number one is right around this time of year, Q4, you want to start doing a tax estimate for the year. So you want to collect all the income and the various sources of income that you're realizing this year. So you can actually do a tax estimate to see where you're at relative to some of these cliffs like you're talking about with Irma. So that's number one, do a tax estimate each year in the fourth quarter. Number two is, and it's probably a little premature to do this, usually you start to see indications in November and December, but these open-end mutual funds will issue, typically issue some guidance on what their expected distributions are going to be. So all you have to do is go to the mutual fund site or go to your advisor and monitor that. So when they issue guidance, you can use their estimate of what they think they're going to realize and input that into your tax estimate so you can see where you're at. Next thing you can do is you can actively realize capital losses right now while markets are bad, assuming you have any, to try to offset capital gains distributions. So the way the rules work is you can offset an unlimited number of capital gains with capital losses. So you can strategically sell assets that have some losses in them, realize the capital loss, and either wait 31 days to buy that asset back to avoid wash sale rules, or purchase something that's similar but not substantially similar enough so you can maintain roughly the same type of position if you don't want to wait the 31 days. And then the last thing is you don't want to buy more open-end mutual funds near the end of the year. Because the way that would work is if you buy a fund on December 1st, and on December 2nd, they issue their capital gains distributions, the tax liability related to that as well, it doesn't matter whether you've owned the fund one day, you're still going to have to pay your portion. So you got to be very careful about that in after-tax accounts right here at the end of the year. And then as a uh, another thing you can consider because you have all these open-end mutual funds that you you may be dealing with this. One is you can mitigate future problems by starting to get those distributed to you rather than reinvested so you don't exacerbate the situation. And then perhaps use those monies to buy more tax-efficient vehicles like exchange-traded funds or passively managed funds that don't have as much turnover or trading going on. And then over time, perhaps try to figure out how you strategically move towards those. It's a good problem to have, having lots of capital gains, but these are some ways that you can try to mitigate some of the issues that you're talking about there, Jeff. And our next question is from Marie related to target date funds. Hi, Roger. This is Marie calling from Georgia. Thanks so much for your podcast. It's really helpful. I'm about 10 to 15 years from retirement and I have invested my retirement savings over the years in Vanguard target retirement funds. I have a substantial amount in there, maybe around a million dollars. And as I'm listening to your podcast and hearing about your strategies for taking money out during retirement, I'm thinking instead of having a target retirement fund, should I have separate funds so that when it comes time to take money out, the amount that's in cash, the amount that's in bonds and stocks would be in separate places? Or is that going to be easier than I imagine in 10 to 15 years when it comes time to withdraw those funds? I guess when I think about not having you know money at risk in the stock market that needs to be used relatively soon, I'm not sure how that kind of happens in the sense of a target retirement fund where everything is put together. Thanks so much for your thoughts on this. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Marie, you are spot on in your estimation of target date funds and well ahead of the game in terms of thinking about that. You said you're 10 or 15 years away from retirement. At some point, and you're probably premature if you're 10 to 15 years away, you do want to start to think through creating the individual components 
of how you're actually going to get your money and go through a process to actually take the money, this million dollars you said you had, I believe in 401k, and segregate it based off of the time horizon that that money is going to be invested. And as you said, some of that money may be used in year one of retirement to help supplement whatever other income sources, whereas other money will be used 10 to 15 years down the road, even when you're retired. And having a target date fund doesn't help you accomplish that all very well, as you stated. It's all put into one portfolio. And the way a target date fund works is you pick a date of when you are going to retire, let's say a 2030 target date fund, and it will create an asset allocation of stocks, bonds, and other assets targeted for someone who's going to retire at age 30. And then as you walk closer to that age, it will get more quote unquote conservative or bond heavy as it gets closer to 2030. I am not a fan of target date funds. They're totally fine if you're 20 or 30 years old. If you were to use a fund like this, I would much rather have a target asset allocation, which is one that doesn't move around. It says, okay, I'm going to be 80% stocks and 20% bonds or whatever the ratio is, and I'm never going to change. That I like a lot more than a target date fund. I do think at some point you're going to want to own the individual pieces, Marie, so you can actually build, in our verbiage, our pie cake. So you can have the money, as you said, that isn't really supposed to be at risk in the insured cash account or in the money market account. And then there are other assets in the appropriate time horizon bound investment categories. So when you go to draw money, you can pull it from the appropriate type of asset, which is something that you can't do in a target date fund. Even if it has a lot of bonds and cash right now, they're getting hurt in the markets, just like any other portfolio it is. And Marie, if you were retired right now and you needed money, it doesn't matter if that fund had a healthy chunk of money within the portfolio because you're going to have to sell the asset and it's likely down for the year. And that just doesn't give you the functionality that I think that you need when you're in retirement. And you can do this, by the way, without adding a lot of complexity. And that's you know one of the beauties of a target allocation fund or a target date fund is they're simple, right? You don't have to worry about picking out of the, you know, the menu of investment options. I think most people that I have observed when I'm looking at their portfolio, they're either drastically under allocated or they're drastically over allocated because there's, you know, it gets confusing. I'll just buy a little bit of all of them and they'll have 20 different funds in their portfolio. You can do this in a simple way and you're far enough away, Marie, that you can start thinking about this and you're probably fine in a target date fund, but I do like having the individual pieces. So hopefully that gave you some framework as you walk this journey. So our last question is related to the strategy of Roth conversions. Hi, Roger. This is Rob from the Seattle area. Love your podcast. My wife and I have been listening for the last couple of years, and we've become addicted to the weekly drop of every podcast that you produce. So thank you much for all the information. Have a quick question for you on Roth conversions. This is probably more of an optimal question, but do you factor in the cost of doing a Roth conversion in the form of what we pay in tax, whether it be the 12% or 22% versus looking at that money as return on investment down the road and what could be optimally better. I am 60. My wife is 58. So our time frame for withdrawing or beginning to withdraw from those tax deferred accounts would probably be at least 10 years. So that might mean 10 years of growth that we might be able to obtain versus paying the cost of for the taxes now and letting the, the reduced amount grow in those same 10 years. Anyway, I hope this makes sense. I appreciate all you do, and uh, I look forward to your answer. First, I want to compliment you on acknowledging that this question is related to the optimization stage of building your retirement plan of record. This is an optimization question. I'm going to take a little, little sidebar here of what I'm talking about, and I'm going to try to label questions as to what phase of the project your retirement project, they fall in. So when you think of building a retirement plan of record, I think it's important to understand 
what stage of this planning you're talking about. And there are four basic stages. There is the vision stage of this is what we want as an outcome for our life. Talk about goals. There is a feasible stage in counting the cost of those goals, matching them with the resources to say, is it feasible for me financially to accomplish these goals? Got to have a feasible plan, right? You got to have a feasible plan of record. The third stage is making that feasible plan resilient. You got to have a resilient plan of record, which is making sure that you don't get knocked off course easy with markets and life and so forth. And then the last stage of a project in building a retirement plan of record is to optimize that plan. And in theory, you could totally ignore optimization and have a feasible, resilient plan, maybe not eke out every dollar or opportunity and live a great life. And your question, as you noted, Rob, is in the optimization stage. This is cherry on top stuff that we're talking about. And this can definitely enhance the journey, but it should not be critical to the journey's success, if that makes sense. So I appreciate you pointing that out, Rob. I'm going to start labeling questions as to what phase of a retirement project they're in so we can make sure we keep making the main thing the main thing, which is the life outcomes. Okay, now to your question regarding Roth conversion strategies. Let me start with the end, which is you, you can't really figure this out, which one actually makes sense. You just want to think through it in an organized way so you can just get to a judgment call. And a lot of times these judgment calls can be doing something in between rather than do them or not. Do a little bit of this rather than not. And I'll use myself as an example who is still working and will be for a long period of time. I'm in the highest tax bracket and I save in my 401k and I had to deal with this. I'm like, hmm, should I make Roth contributions? I don't have a lot there. I can't do it as a Roth IRA contribution, but I have my 401k. And so a couple of years ago, we switched and started making our employee contributions as Roth contributions, even though I'm in the higher tax bracket, which mathematically may not make any sense. It'd be a tough case for that. Why pay the highest tax bracket right now when you can save it tax deferred? And my logic went this way. One is, I don't have really any Roth prior to doing this. I have a lot of tax deferred assets, so I wasn't very diversified. And if I just continued to build up tax de deferred assets, I was going to exacerbate a bigger issue or could potentially later on. So when I started to think of Roger as his 72 or 75 year old self, I'm like, would Roger be happy that I started a Roth? program and started contributing to Roth, would Roger be happy to have a lot of Roth assets when he's 75, even though he paid a high tax bracket on it? I'm thinking Roger at 75 is going to be, dude, thank you so much for doing that. That was really good. So part of it was I was trying to give a gift to my future self. And the other part of this too, was that right now I can afford to pay the taxes. It hurts. It gives me indigestion, but I can afford it. It's annoying. So that was my logic. So Rob, as you think about this at age 60 or so, here are some things that you want to consider. First is, what does your tax diversity look like? Meaning, do you have Roth assets now? How much tax deferred assets? How much in after-tax assets do you have in terms of drawing from your assets to support your retirement? That's important to know. One thing I like to, when I'm examining this problem with someone is to estimate if we don't do Roth conversions, what does the potential required minimum distribution look like at age 72 if we don't do Roth conversions? And if that is building up to be a fairly large number, that's important to understand because if you don't do Roth conversions and you build up these pre-tax assets, and yes, you get the benefit of tax deferral, but then you also are much more time constrained than you ever were, meaning at age 72, they're going to force you to start taking some out, at least under the current rules, about 3.6%, I think, in the first year. And then, But that percentage increases over time. That's going to force you to have taxable income. And that taxable income is going to impact your taxes. You know, currently, IRMA surcharges on Medicare. It's going to impact that, and you may not be able to avoid those. And, and that's something to consider. So first, I would look at your tax diversity, 
Second, you want to look at, well, what earned income are you having between now and then? You know, you're age 60, let's assume you're retired. Do you have room within the current tax bracket? Are you earning 60,000 as a couple when you could potentially earn up to 100 with standard deductions and be in the 12% bracket? Do you have room within the tax bracket, whether it's the 12%, the 22, or the 24, to where you could realize income and pay 22 to 24%, say? Historically, those are really low rates. And we don't know what the future rates are going to be. We do know that brackets are going to revert back to, to uh, the pre, the, I forget what year it was. And in 2025, we're reverting our tax brackets to the prior law, which had tighter brackets, which means you would climb up a little bit quicker. So we're in a historically low tax bracket structure. And we already know it's going to revert back if Congress does nothing. And it could get worse later on. So is that a bird in the hand? I think that's something to understand. And then does having Roth dollars and building that give you more flexibility to avoid Irma surcharges on Medicare or other things later on? All of these things come into play, Rob. And there's not going to be some mathematical formula that tells you the decision. But in my view, you want to think through it in setting yourself up for the future version of you. And I think it's important to have a mindset, Rob, that it's not about avoiding taxes. You will pay taxes. You're just managing the timing of paying those taxes. Now, some other reasons why you might avoid doing Roth conversions might be that you already have a lot of Roth dollars and or you have fairly good tax diversification between after-tax and pre-tax dollars. Or you are planning on doing these qualified charitable distributions. So a lot more is going to go to charity. And maybe as a legacy upon your death, a lot of money is going to go to charity. So all of these things are going to factor in. And this really illustrates a point, Rob, on all of this stuff. Almost never is it crystal clear. And so that's why it's so important that you have a consistent way of filtering these things through a process So you can be organized in your decision-making and go the right direction to get to the best judgment, because that's always what it's going to end up being. It's just a judgment call. But I think these are some things that I would factor into that process. Now let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to do a little baby step you can do in the next seven days, not just to rock retirement, but to rock life. All right. In the next seven days, I challenge you to do something you wouldn't normally do. Who what does that mean? I don't know. Well, I just got done doing a Spartan race today with some friends from a coaching group, and it was a blast. And I've done things like that before. But being there, there were a lot of people that looked like, well, actually, I know that because I asked the question, is how many is this your first race of this type? And there were so many hands that were raised, so many people that you would look at, and if you saw them on the street, it's like, no, they would never do a Spartan race. And my daughter is coming with me. I'm, I have an event I have to go to in Los Angeles in early December, and she's going to come, and the event's tied to a Spartan race, and she's coming with me. It's going to be a father-daughter trip. And she doesn't do this type of stuff. She doesn't exercise. She works so much and is going to school. And she's excited to go. She says she's open to the experience. But she, I can tell she's getting a little bit intimidated by it. And I think that's a good thing. So do something. It could be a little baby thing. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't have to be physical. Do something that intimidates you this week. Speaking of my daughter, I'm about to head off and my daughter, my son, and one other, we're, uh, Bree, we're going to go play some Xbox. That's the thing that we do together because we live in different places and we just sit there and chat. So I'm about to go do that. Have a great day. Wait, she's calling right now. I'm going to go get her. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and does not guarantee future results. All indices are unmanaged and cannot be invested in directly. Make sure you consult your legal, tax, or financial advisor before making any decisions.